Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, course on Global Pandemics 101 offered by the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. My name is Jorge Viñuales. I'm a professor at the University of Cambridge, uh, and the purpose of this uh, discussion is really to introduce some aspects of uh, the interconnections between the environment and global health, including uh, an issue that is incre increasingly discussed uh, in in global negotiations, which is uh, One Health, the One Health approach. So start uh, with some facts. Uh, I, I will be basing uh, my facts on, on, on a report of the Intergovernmental uh, uh, Science and Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, a long name for what most people call IBES. And um, the report that I'm referring to is a report of uh, late 2020, in which the IBES and a number of other organizations essentially mentioned that uh, just as a matter of uh, re-emphasizing the importance of the nexus, uh, the majority, 70% of emerging diseases such as Ebola, Zika or Nipah encephalitis and almost all known pandemics, influenza, HIV, AIDS and COVID-19, are zoonotic diseases or zoonosis. Uh, that means that they are caused by a pathogen that jumps from uh, an animal host into humans. Uh, the uh, importance is also reminded uh, or, or re-emphasized by the fact that uh, there are an estimated 1.7 million uh, uh, currently undiscovered viruses that exist in mammal and avian hosts, and many of them, uh, essentially between six and 800,000, have the ability to infect humans. And that some of the uh, animal reservoirs that contain pathogens with pandemic potential are, of course, mammals, but also some birds and livestock. So uh, I guess that uh, this very brief uh, recollection of, of, of facts is just to, to put in perspective the fact that this is a very important nexus for health and that it has to be governed international. Now, if one looks at how it is governed international, uh, then, which is the second part of my presentation, then the question is a bit more complex. And, and in order to make it simpler, one must uh, uh, distinguish two main concepts. One is the concept of prevention, at least uh, how it is understood in in environmental circles and in, in many other circles. And a different concept is the concept of containment. Some people also speak about response. Uh, the IHRs, the International Health Regulations, in the revised version of 2005, they are essentially an instrument of containment. So they don't focus on preventing the spillover of a pathogen from an animal to a human host. They don't focus on preventing outbreaks of uh, infectious disease, they only focus on, on managing or containing the spread of infectious disease internationally. Uh, that's, that's an important uh, shortcoming of the IHRs, and that makes a clear distinction between what, what, what one could call uh, real prevention, genuine prevention, or deep prevention. Deep prevention is about actually preventing the uh, the outbreaks and the spillover of pathogens from uh, humans to animals. There are different ways of, of deep prevention, but something to keep in mind is that many of the uh, drivers of this uh, uh, emergence or re-emergence of infectious disease are also major environmental degradation phenomena. Just to give you a couple of examples, uh, land use change is directly linked with the increased probability of uh, infectious disease emergence. Uh, wildlife trade, both legal and illegal, is directly linked with uh, the uh, spillover sometimes of infectious disease. There has been a lot of discussion about pangolins and the role in the, uh, in the emergence of the COVID-19 disease. Uh, climate change, of course, and desertification are very important because they, they have many different effects, including the uh, redistribution, the geographical redistribution of disease vectors uh, around the world to new places where uh, there is uh, uh, a much higher potential for an outbreak. So you see that this nexus is, is very important. Now, if one looks at this nexus from the prevention perspective, really the prevention of spillover and outbreaks or deep prevention, uh, one can uh, see that at the uh, 
legal level, the macro drivers of, of potential pandemics, climate change, land use change, uh, wildlife traffic, etc. These uh, macro drivers are, are, are governed by a range of important treaties. I will mention, for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, the uh, site as the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, the Climate Change Convention, the UNFCCC and, and the Paris Agreement, uh, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, then a regional uh, instrument, the Protocol on Water and Health, which is a, a very important instrument for the connection with water, uh, and a, a number of others. What, what you see really is that the macro drivers, or in other words, what could be called upstream deep prevention, is fairly governed out there. And what you just need uh, in that realm is more specificity and more implementation. On the other hand, on the other hand, if instead of looking at uh, drivers, one looks at uh, events, and by events I mean the spillover itself, which is an event, or, for example, the mutation, the genetic mutation that gives rise to a new strand of a pathogen that may be, for example, uh, resistant to uh, 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 antibiotics. Or you look at the outbreaks themselves, the outbreak events, which is an, an outbreak is a sudden increase in the uh, number of infected people in a given area as compared to a certain baseline. So if you look at those events, what is very curious is that they are almost not regulated in the global health architecture. Uh, even the IHRs, the IHRs are only about um, detecting and notifying outbreaks, but they do not even attempt to prevent the outbreak by uh, requiring states to adopt a range of measures uh, to improve the health of their populations. So this uh, other form of, of deep prevention which we call not upstream, but midstream deep prevention, is a big uh, blind spot in the uh, legal architecture. Now, uh, moving to my third part, uh, or the third part of my presentation, what weaknesses were exposed by, by COVID-19? Many, many uh, weaknesses. Of course, uh, the global health architecture has been constantly put to test over the years, and, and each time that it has been an epidemic or a pandemic, there have been attempts at, at, at reforming that architecture or improving the system. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic has been particularly uh, difficult uh, and, and it has unveiled or re-emphasized a number of problems. I will just mention a f four of them, but there are many. One of them is the focus on uh, of the international health regulations just on containment. So very little, almost nothing about real genuine prevention. That's something that could be remedied perhaps in the next two years uh, through the negotiation of a global pandemic instrument. Uh, another uh, important aspect is a focus, the overwhelming focus on human health. Now, this has been uh, uh, flagged as a major problem uh, in discussions of what is increasingly referred to as uh, the One Health approach. Now, One Health, the, entered the policy discourse uh, in the early 2000s, right after uh, the, uh, the problems that uh, arose from the uh, SARS and the H5N1 uh, uh, epidemics. Uh, the uh, development of the, of the concept are, or the pathway that follow the concept uh, in global discourse uh, uh, required the increasing interaction between different organizations, uh, and particularly four organizations that have become, that have really increased their, their collaboration. Uh, the FAO, the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the WHO, the World Health Organization. Uh, the OEA, which is better known in its, uh, in its French uh, name, which is the Organisation Internationale pour les Épisodies. And, uh, of course, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. Uh, these uh, four organizations, they set up uh, a high-level panel uh, that came up in late 2021 with um, an attempt at defining this, this, this approach. The definition that the, the high-level uh, panel provided is uh, an integrated unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animal, and ecosystems. Now, it's important to keep in mind that one health does not only mean or cannot only mean just integrating 
animal, human, and environmental health, it also means that there is no such thing as purely local or national health as opposed to you know, global health. Uh, things that happen very far away can affect very quickly the situation of a country, despite the fact that a country may try to insulate itself through trade measures and traffic measures. It's very important to keep in mind that this is a global problem and it has to be handled as a global problem. We are learning to that slowly because One Health uh, has an Achilles heel, which is the fact that, yes, we, we increasingly agree on the One Health approach, but we still lack any clear strategy to make it actionable, to make it operational. There have been proposals, I will refer to them uh, briefly later, but uh, we're still not yet there. Third uh, main problem that the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, unveiled, or, or actually in this case re-emphasized, is the issue of implementation. The IHRs were largely, were, let's put it in, in mild terms, were poorly implemented. Sometimes they were utterly ignored. And, and this is very, very important and very important to flag because some countries such as South Africa that try to abide by, uh, by the IHRs and notify very early on uh, the uh, emergence of a new disease strand, a new uh, virus strand, uh, well, they were penalized for following actually uh, the IHR system. So we see that the IHRs have both an implementation deficit, but also a design problem, not just because they focus only on containment, but because even if they, they are fully implemented, they have side effects that are uh, uh, adverse for the countries that abide by them. Uh, fourth and final uh, uh, big issue that was uh, unveiled by the uh, pandemic is an issue of equity, equity fault lines. I think that the most important or most visible uh, aspect of these equity fault lines uh, can be pinned down to access to vaccines. Uh, there was a fight for vaccines. Some uh, rich countries actually captured most of the vaccine, the early vaccine production. Uh, and, and that was short-sighted because, as I was saying earlier, One Health cannot only mean the integration of environmental, uh, human and animal health, but it also needs to uh, uh, take into account that there is no real health or no protection against a pandemic when uh, we're not looking at the global situation as uh, opposed to just the local political situation. Of course, there are political reasons why countries prefer to prioritize their own populations, but it's short-sighted. I could, I could mention uh, many different issues such as disinformation, uh, the anti-vaccine campaigns, uh, a range of things that uh, are also affect uh, environmental uh, discussions such as climate change, but I will stop there because I think uh, it's, it's time to really uh, put a bit more emphasis on what can be done. And this is my fourth and last uh, uh, element for today. And again, much has been, much has been uh, proposed so I will simply flag three main processes that I think have a lot of potential. The first is the, uh, the launch of an intergovernmental uh, body, INB, by uh, a special session of the World Health Assembly in December of 2021, uh, which is supposed to draft by 2024 uh, 24, um, a global pandemic instrument. The legal nature of this instrument is still debated. It could be a convention, it could be uh, as the IHRs, it could be uh, regulations adopted by the by the assembly. It could be something else, an agreement. Uh, but it is under negotiation, and the issue of One Health uh, has been uh, uh, prominently discussed. There is a draft of a few days ago that was circulated by, or was made available by, by the secretariat, and and we see that One Health appears there in different ways. Uh, not necessarily the, the, the ways that one would expect One Health to feature in. Uh, there is a separate section on One Health that would make little sense because it's an approach that is cross-cutting, transversal. So it cannot be a separate section in a treaty. But I think that the, the, the paper that has been circulated is only there to put some uh, proposals, to give some order, some uh, initial uh, systematic order to the proposal that have been put, uh, uh, put forward by states. A second uh, uh, important uh, development, which gained momentum uh, in May of this year, of 2022, is the amendment of the international health regulations. So uh, there has been a call for uh, states to submit proposals for amendment. Some states, such as the United States, for example, have already submitted 
uh, some uh, important amendment proposals. But there is a process right now to, for other uh, uh, member states to submit proposals by uh, September of this year, of 2022, which will then fit into a, a discussion within the WHO, which will be considered probably uh, 2023 is a bit early, but probably in 2024. Uh, so we are uh, now in a process of revising the IHRs uh, yet another time uh, since the 2005 revision. And then the third uh, aspect that I should mention here uh, really looks at this integration from the perspective of uh, environmental uh, policy. Uh, the fifth ses session of the United uh, Nations Environment Assembly, UNEA 5.2, uh, uh, that met in uh, February uh, 2022, came up with uh, two resolutions, but there is particularly one uh, a very important resolution that that strengthened, that tried to uh, add momentum to the mainstreaming of the One Health approach, uh, particularly from the perspective of preventing uh, deep prevention of zoonotic disease outbreaks and pandemics. My own suggestion, if I may be uh, allowed to give just one single suggestion in this process, is that uh, at this stage, noise too many proposals, too much out there is becoming unhelpful. I think we should focus very, very specifically and have a very clear focus. If we really want to give One Health as an approach to the nexus between environment and health, uh, a clear traction in international negotiations, one must focus on deep prevention. Deep prevention understood as actually preventing the spillover or the outbreaks themselves. Now, because deep prevention of uh, outbreaks and spillovers is already well covered at the level of macro drivers, essentially uh, land use change, climate change, etc., I think that the main focus of deep prevention efforts should be on midstream deep prevention, which is trying to address uh, the uh, events, the events such as spillovers such as genetic mutation of pathogens such as outbreaks themselves and as i mentioned earlier today uh, i think uh, there is a big hole in the global governance of health in that aspect which we should be feeling thank you very much for your attention <laughs>